Um, okay, yeah, so this one's cool. Uh, we actually had a practical guide to low-carbohydrate living until, uh, which was a sort of New Zealand title, and then an Australian friend of mine from Brisbane who's a Collingwood supporter um, suggested it was going to be what the fat. So that's stuck, really. Um, and that's what it is. Did they win yesterday? Oh, okay. <laughs> Who was playing at the MCG then? Was people walking around with Collingwood scarves? Anyway, well, I digress. Okay, well, welcome to my uh, welcome Melbourne, and welcome to uh, my world, which is public health, and that's uh, what we're booking into t today's science with Professor Volokh as some some more uh, public aspects of what's going on in the world right now. I think. Nutrition is changing rapidly. You're right in the middle, folks, of, of a revolution in the way we think about our health, uh, especially around food. I think that revolution started a while back, though, and I think what happened explains a lot about what's happening now. Uh, so my field, public health, really started in around the 1850s in its current form, around a time that in London, Cholera was spreading around the place, and it was a nasty disease. You're okay with no screening. Oh, I've, got, I've got a slide. That's my oh, first slide. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> See, that people expect you to have like pretty pictures um, that may come. So, a guy called John Snow figured it out. He was the first of the what we call epidemiologists. He figured out that people getting sick clustered around wells and they, it was affecting their life. They were dying from stuff and if they closed down the source then they wouldn't die of stuff. And that was really what happened in public health for the next little while is that we stopped people dying. Public health 1.0. We're, we're now into public health 2.0 and hopefully we're seeing the end of that soon. Is We don't catch stuff and die of it now. We uh, get these non-communicable diseases, um, and I think what we eat has a fair bit to do with that. So we've been thinking about what to tell people to eat and how that might pan out for a long time. Uh, but the strange thing about all that is that public health didn't begin in 1850 in a well in London. Societies, whole societies, have had a deep ingrained knowledge, a shared knowledge about what makes them well since humans have been living in any sort of community. See, I told you we had one, Rod. Um, I just want to tell you a, a couple of short stories about some work I did in the remote Pacific that I think is quite interesting in this context. So this is southern Vanuatu. It's an island called Anaitan. It's the southernmost point. It's a beautiful, lovely, untouched place. In that public health sense, there's plenty of living long and then dropping dead going on, and sort of in the primal paleo sense of the word, that, that life expectancy is uh, reasonably good, uh, but people don't die slowly like most of us in Australia and New Zealand will from these chronic diseases. They end of life comes reasonably quickly, uh, and I assume that's what most of you are aspiring for, right? That's true, isn't it? Um, Talked to a guy, Andre, before he. I, I often tell a story about uh, you know my fantasy of dying a young man's death at the age of 92, racing my mate up a steep hill and and, and winning the last sprint and, and not even having time to unclip and 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 he he sees me faltering and he too wins his last sprint. So we're both sort of old wizened turtles lying there upside down, dead as a doornail. Uh, do you pe do people think about that? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, of course you do. If you don't, you should. Um, so, of course, the, the southern Vanuatu is a very uh, nice place. The sort of traditional living's going on. Uh, there's this obvious, deep, close knowledge about nutrition in the Western A. Price mould that is held by these people. And, of course, the World Health Organisation knows that they're, they're healthy and they're concerned that in the future they might be less healthy. So their solution is to get experts, and I, in this case, was the expert, to go along and tell them how to live. But they give you materials, the food pyramid, exercise more, move, uh, eat less, that sort of thing. Um, and it's immediately obvious when you go there that 
Um, the only thing I could do if I opened my mouth and told them about anything is to cause damage. So you just sort of sit around on the, um, this area for a few weeks, take a few blood pressures and that's the end of that. Um, which is quite nice, but it's, it's reassuring that there's still some places in the world where societies still hold this knowledge about nutrition. Um, there's some imported food, just a little, just a little friendly pig. Um, but mostly it's this sort of thing. It's whole, unprocessed food, whole plants and animals. Um, and when it gets down to it, it is a diet that's relatively low in carbohydrate, higher in fat, and whole food, which is exactly what we're advocating for. Um, if you haven't done this, I actually helped catch some of these fish. Well, it, in, in a sense, I helped catch them. These uh, ones at the bottom are flying fish. What you do is you light a lantern, you paddle out in your dugout canoe, and you stay there for half an hour, and when your boat is full of fish, you paddle back in, because they fly in. <laughs> Which is sort of cool, right? So a beautiful place, but, but the Pacific doesn't look like that all over. This is um, in the North Pacific. It's uh, an island called Tarawa. It's part of a chain called Kiribati, which uh, is most well known, I think, for the Battle of Tarawa, a World War II battle where the Japanese were encamped on this island and the Americans pounded them, uh, a marine force, for over a week this battle went on. And the population was decimated, but it had sat around a couple of thousand people for most of the time the people that live on this coral atoll. It's 40 kilometres long and it's about 200 metres wide. It now has about 45,000 people living here. They can't grow any local food really because of there's only a metre above sea level anyway and sea level rise, uh, lack of soil, high population. Uh, the lagoon you see there is polluted from a combination of things so you wouldn't put your foot in there let alone eat fish from there. Um, and off the coast is a number of factory processing ships from China and Taiwan that are uh, using up all the natural resources. So you can imagine that uh, the traditional society is gone, the food supply now more closely resembles this. And we've got a situation where I think diabetes here would be amongst the highest in the world. So I think probably about 60% of the population has diabetes. Um, you might go, okay, well that's interesting. Um, but what that means in reality is for a small island of 45,000 people, they're amputating about 20 uh, limbs a month from the locals through complications of diabetes. And if you start to do the maths over a couple of years, that's you know, nearly 500 people's legs or feet coming off from the complications of diabetes. I ended up measuring the blood sugars on the diabetes team, just to show them how you, you try and find out about diabetes. And uh, you send them away and they come back in the morning and do this faster blood glucose. And every, you know, it should be around five millimoles, hopefully a bit under. Um, and every one of the diabetes team is 10 or above. So, you know, there's 100% diabetes in the diabetes team. Uh, things have fallen apart. And you sort of, again, you walk around with the World Health Organization guidelines which resemble these, it isn't exactly these, but they resemble these and again it, it just seems to you that's not going to end well is it? It's just not. Eating less and moving more isn't quite the right advice and this type of diet doesn't resemble anything that they ever ate in the entire history that they've been around for these people. And this was published earlier this year, it's a, a journal called Open Heart and it was just looking at was there any ever any evidence for the public health guidelines of low fat? And the answer is no, there wasn't um, and there still isn't, but we're persisting with the idea that we should eat low fat. And really it's led to a genre of food that I think we can all now find particularly perverse. Um, you know, this is clearly not actual food um, in the Michael Pollan's sense it wouldn't rot or your grandmother would not recognise it. Um, it falls into a broader category called medical pornography. Uh, and unless you get a free mask with that one. Um, Milo's, in, uh, this is the stuff that now has on the new star rating. You're familiar with the star rating? This is a four and a half star rated um, product out of five stars that is. Um, 
where whole milk was down at, at um, three. So, you know, wielded by the food industry, it's sort of ended badly, I guess. Uh, and the science has moved on. The science has well and truly moved on, I think. So I think we can now understand the broad range of metabolic problems that we have, from diabetes to cancer to cardiovascular disease to neurological problems like Alzheimer's and dementia, as having the same basic cause. Uh, it's an inflammatory process. It's driven by insulin resistance in the presence of sugar and carbohydrates. Uh, we also know that's the problem, that getting insulin resistant, what does that mean? Uh, we need to get glucose into our cells, we need to do that to live. Um, we vary enormously in how we're able to do that uh, between people, but even within ourselves there's a whole bunch of things that change that all the time. I just made a quick list of the things that I know of that make you more insulin resistant, and there's a whole bunch of psychological and physical things, like Poor sleep and stress will make you more insulin resistant. Um, maybe too much exercise under some conditions, certainly too little exercise. A whole bunch of environmental poisons like smoking and, and other things. Um, too little sun might make you insulin resistant through vitamin D. Too much might for other reasons. There's a whole bunch of dietary factors there. Um, the most interesting addition to that list of mine is um, high iron, in fact. So high iron can um, perhaps make you more insulin resistant. That exciting new field of uh, the other beings that make up you, uh, the gut, your gut microbes and how they affect your health. And then a whole bunch of things that you may or may not be able to change, uh, like your age and your ethnicity. So you can see from that list that that's pretty much modern life. Uh, modern life confers insulin resistance. You chuck in the low fat paradigm and we've got a problem. We've got a problem that we eventually lose control of our glucose levels in our blood. Glucose is corrosive, damages everything that it touches, which is everything in your body because it's in your blood. Uh, but preceding that is this idea that high insulin itself causes problems. So besides the obvious thing that, that if you're here you're probably aware that insulin turns off your ability to burn and access your fat stores. Um, and tries to store everything that comes into your body, high insulin itself um, is implicated in the causes of virtually every chronic disease across every body part. Uh, and so if you took that view, which I think is, is that science is not new science, we've known about that science for quite a long time, then if you wanted to describe to people what to eat, you might say something like this. A balanced diet in the context of whole food is one which normalises your blood glucose levels um, and prevents you hypersecreting insulin. So that's a sort of medical speak, but it means you don't need to uh, eat whatever it takes to have normal blood sugar and not have high insulin. And I think that has some important implications because that meal might be profoundly different depending on who and what you are. My 14-year-old son can eat a good deal more carbohydrate and still maintain a normal blood glucose level um, and not hypersecrete insulin. Um, as we get older, I'm a 47 year old male, then exactly the same meal that my son Sam eats will have a profoundly different metabolic effect on me. And my wife Louise is probably slightly more insulin resistant than I am and so exactly the same meal that I eat will have a slightly different metabolic effect on her. And I think this is profoundly important when we're thinking about what people will eat. Because you, you see these debates about, oh, is this safe and what about this and what should we be telling people to eat? Well, we should be telling people to eat whole foods. But they're going to have to change the composition of that depending on who they are and what they're doing. And you'll see this because people go, well, th these, are, these are individual data from uh, a study called the A to Z diet study where they looked at four different diets. It's a randomised control trial. But what's happening here, these are individual weight losses from people on a low fat diet um, over, over a year or so. And you can see that some people on a low fat diet, actually they do lose weight. 
So there's a benefit to some people from being on that type of approach. These are individual data, and it's a nice way when you look at scientific data to look at how individuals respond. Now some people, nothing happens to them, and some people on that diet get fatter. And we look at that as, we call that number to treat or number needed to harm, and it's a really important way of thinking about things and when you're working with your doctor, when they're explaining medications to you, should I take a statin, should I do this, should I do that, um, should, are you getting surgery for your knee, you know, doctor, how many of these operations have you done, how many turn out to be successful, how many do nothing, how many people got worse as a result of the surgery. Um, those are reasonable questions to ask your medical professional. Um, and they're also reasonable questions to ask about diet. Um, how many people are harmed from this? How many people aren't? Uh, for example, I've just been reading about some um, new form of back surgery where they fuse some vertebrae together with some sort of um, glue. You know, the number needed to treat is 18. In other words, for every 18 operation, one is successful. The number needed to treat for antibiotics is six. In other words, the people who benefit from taking an antibiotic above placebo control is one in six people. And that might be worthwhile, and it could be life-saving, but not all drugs are 100% successful, and neither are all diets. So how does a low-fat diet compare with what we're talking about today, a low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet? Well, I think on the, this is the same study. You might judge that as being more successful, more people benefit than the low fat. Um, there's still some neutral and certainly less people are harmed, but so, some people still get fatter um, on that type of diet. But on balance, we think it's probably a better approach. And then in the same study, you can go into it and look in more detail at what's going on. You can say, well, um, how do people lose weight on the low fat depending on how insulin sensitive they are? And that says, yes, look at this. So if you're insulin resistant, you lose hardly any weight. If you're insulin sensitive, you lose a substantial amount. And what about the low carb, high fat? Well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's equally effective. I think this is profoundly important when we're trying to compare uh, what we should eat and what we should do. Is that this idea of insulin sensitivity underlies everything. But the major problem is this that the people who most need the advice to eat less sugar and carbohydrate and eat more fat are our diabetics, people who are severely insulin resistant and now have trouble getting glucose out of their blood into their cells no matter what. Um, here's the current guidelines of about how much carbohydrate you should eat if you're a diabetic, around 240 grams of carbohydrate a day. On the left there you'll see a smaller vial of about four or five grams of sugar, which is about how much sugar you have in your blood. So you see, we're, uh, I find it perverse that we're still treating diabetics with large amounts of carbohydrate. On first principles it makes no sense, and on deeper science it makes no sense. The reality is that most Australians don't just eat 240 grams of carbohydrate, they eat closer to 330 grams of carbohydrate a day, which is that jar pretty much filled up and overflowing um, to maintain that one teaspoon of glucose throughout the day. Um, it's not an essential nutrient, uh, contrary to what you might hear. Um, we do need some glucose in our blood, but we can get it from all sorts of places. Um, this needs to change. We also know that I'm sure you'll hear more about this from Professor Volokh since it's all of his work that I'm showing you um, now. But we also know that uh, eating fat doesn't translate to fat in your blood. It's carbohydrates. So this is, these are triglycerides. This is a, a feeding study. People in this case have fed a low-fat, high-carbohydrate, heart foundation type diet. There's the postprandial, the fat in your blood after eating response. And then the fat in your blood after eating a diet that's three times higher in fat and three times higher in saturated fat. And this is profoundly important, I think, missed by most people. Um, that we thought dietary fat, fat in your blood, getting fat, were the same thing. Um, on some principles they were spelt the same, F-A-T, uh, and they sort of looked the same. But it just doesn't turn out that way, that's not how the biology works. Um, further than that, when you start to 
put people on diets for a sustained period of time and you look at what we know to be metabolic risk factors, markers for poor health, the fats in their blood, the cholesterols, uh, the more detailed things, insulin, then the improvement from being on a high fat but low carbohydrate diet is profound compared to the smaller improvement on being on the low fat diet. So it's not like the low fat diet has no efficacy, it has a little bit and it's probably better for some people, but this is a better approach for many and certainly is not known to have any negative events for most. Uh, and lastly we talked about inflammation and insulin resistance, look at this, I think this is the same study but the changes in inflammation, all of those are improvements from eating a diet high in fat and these are what you get from eating a diet low in fat. So this high fat diet is profoundly anti-inflammatory and again I think we're missing, missing that important point. So how did we get here? Despite we have this good science, Professor volock has been doing wonderful work for a long time and uh, Dr Stephen Finney before him uh, and they weren't the first because this was the sort of accepted dogma up until the Germans lost World War II that, that that's what you do, the winners rewrote history and came up with this and you can see that we've, we've explored some of the reasons this came out, you know fat is spelt the same and it looks the same as fat in your blood and being fat so maybe this was a good idea. I think the trouble was, and I think this is very important, the trouble was that what happened is rather than that knowledge about what to eat being held in traditional societies, traditional societies started to not exist. We came up with a scientific method which is a great method and used properly you should decide on a hypothesis like this, the food pyramid, you should investigate it and then you should change your mind on the basis of evidence. And scientists would do that, they would do that I think, except something changed. Um, it was really hard to know about the science of nutrition because in order to know you had to go to a medical school library, have access to it and to find papers you had to know they existed to start with. So there was a little club, mostly a boys club frankly, um, and those experts were the only ones who knew about this knowledge and they, we needed someone to advise us so we put the scientists in charge of advising us as well. And therein lies the problem. These experts now when confronted that their original idea was wrong, rather than changing their mind they're defeated by what we call cognitive dissonance. So dissonance is rather than changing your mind you retreat further into your own belief. If only we'd done this bigger, we should have done low fat for everyone, if only they'd eaten exactly how we said, then it would have turned out. And we see exactly the same thing happening in politics all the time. I think we do, we definitely do in Australia. Um, yeah, our stupid idea was right, we just need to do it bigger and then it will definitely be right. You've heard of this. And that's what I think's happened here. So. The problem is if we carry on with this model then as physicist Max Planck said, science will advance one funeral at a time and he's talking about the funerals of the scientists, not of you. So we won't change quickly and it will take a very long time with a lot of health and poor health and suffering in the meantime. So we need to rethink where we get evidence from, I think I would and have been advocating for a public health 3.0 um, which involves you especially, especially you actually since you're here. Uh, public health 3.0 I think is best illustrated by my uh, friend George Henderson. So this guy is an old Kiwi rocker, he had a band called The Puddle, you may not have heard of it. Uh, he started playing in 1981, he's still going. He, things came unstuck for George in 1991 when he was caught at the scene of a pharmacy uh, 
procuring products for home baking. <laughs> and then he was caught at the scene of a medical warehouse a week later while standing on bail, on bail procuring more products. Uh, and you can imagine the authorities had a rather dim view of that sort of behaviour. Um, he was a drug addict and had been now for quite a long time. So they put him in prison for six months. They discover he's got hepatitis C from those decades of intravenous drug use. They let him out and um, rather than being reformed by the system he carries on where he left off and by the early 2000s the combination of drug abuse and hepatitis C that's pretty much he's getting near his uh, end, his teeth are falling out and he's just about dead. But George has this thought, he's like oh well um, I've been reading a fair bit about physiology and biochemistry for 30 years now, um, and I'm especially good at pharmacology. Um, I've got textbooks. Perhaps I'll go up to the medical school library and see if there's anything that I can figure out about this hepatitis C because it's really going to be the end of me. So off he goes, and of course the um, internet's emerging and open access science is now available. He can communicate with authors and other experts. Blogging is starting. And he starts to think about hepatitis C and figure out that the VLDL particle is a carrier for the virus and perhaps if he reduces his carbohydrate and has more nutrient dense food then things might improve. Um, he discovers to his surprise that he can reduce his viral load by some 80 per cent. He amazingly after three decades figures that his drug abuses, his drug cravings are melting away. He starts to blog about his knowledge and discoveries in diet and science and hepatitis C um, and communicate with the experts around the world and he's involved in this discussion now and I think that's important and starts to offer solutions. I discovered George, I don't know, last year sometime when I blogged about something uh, it attracted the attention of other academics who tend not to like people um, saying the opposite to them. Um, it was a Friday and I had a few wines, so I thought it was inappropriate to respond because I would say what I think, which would not end well. Um, but George responds, and over that course of that weekend, there's some 10,000 words uh, go back and forth between him and these academics. And it's immediately obvious to me that, first of all, George knows a lot more than them. He's certainly got the better of them, and he's thought of several things that I wouldn't have thought of. Uh, and I think this is important. Um, this isn't the route to public health 3.0 by any means, uh, but it shows you that I think things have fundamentally changed where we can take back that wisdom that we once held in society and culture about what to eat. We lost it to a few experts. We need to actually claim it back now, and we can do that because we have the internet and we have access to open science and we have events like this. Um, so it's really my major mission is to um, help lead some of that, but I'm certainly not going to be the leader. The leaders will be you and other people. Now, not everyone's going to bother going and listening to the science, making sense of it and making up their own mind, but some are. So welcome. Um, you're most welcome. Um, and I really hope you think of several things that we haven't thought of um, and we can start to think about actual food real food, um, including food that's high in fat, as being good for us again. So thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your time. Thank you.